The next phase of our story is from the late 1890s to the early 1910s. It's roughly coincident with the second dinosaur rush. This is when we see the institutionalization of paleontology, where in the previous phase we had interested individuals who wanted scientifically significant specimens. Now it's these big philanthropy-funded museums who want impressive displays to show off, you know, the beneficence of their benefactors. We had a large volume of specimens flowing into these institutions, more than they could actually prepare so you had these storage vaults full of bones rotting in their jackets because you don't have enough preparators. So they trained a bunch more preparators. This is when we start to see specializations in the lab, though obviously people did wear multiple hats. One result of this flurry of professionalization is that trade skills that had been passed down by word of mouth got codified into training manuals. Scoochert wrote an 1895 manual for both serious beginner paleontologists as well as hobbyists. And I, I think the advice here was for the latter group, where he says, if you come across a very large and impressive specimen, cover it up and call a museum. <laughs> Whereas Herman, writing in 1908 and 9, was approaching the topic from his perspective, which was as a preparator. There's a lot of detail about what goes into mounting and prepping a specimen for display, and a lot of the advice for collection amounts to, please don't make our job any harder. <laughs> Schuchert goes into detail about everything, from what to wear and carry, to how to go about searching, to how to split rock with a sledge. Both say you should cover the specimen with thin, oiled paper. Uh, Herman actually says you should glue it to the specimen. Uh, you, you brush on some shellac and then lay the paper down and brush the paper with water so that it conforms. They say to then bandage the specimen, you would use strips of burlap or muslin dipped in a flour paste. They actually specify that you should add corrosive sublimate, which will both prevent the flour from fermenting and poison any mice that try to eat it, which is slightly sad. For large bones, they suggest that you should do a layer of muslin and then a layer of burlap over top, but even better would be to have a paper layer around the flower bandage and then a layer of plaster of Paris. The plaster of Paris layer could take the form of like an entire case, like you would lay sticks or even iron rods across the specimen and then pack or even pour plaster into it to form one congealed shell. Then once you had a solid mass several inches thick, then you could undermine the specimen and get it out of the ground. 